Hi guys, Matt Easton here. So a point came up under my recent video I did talking about specialisation of certain types of sword and certain types of weapon and pointing out that often when you gain one thing with a sword, for example enhanced cutting ability, you often have to subtract from something else. So an example would be the tool wire for example, it's got a broad curved blade but they're generally speaking not very long, not very good at thrusting uh, and the point of balance tends to be quite far from the hand. So they've become specialised for cutting at the detriment of their ability to thrust, for example. And this is the same with other weapons such as, you know, a halberd, for example. A halberd is, you've essentially taken a spear, one of the oldest weapons of mankind. A spear is a very effective weapon and you've decided you want to add a cutting blade onto it, and maybe a hook or a spike on the back, and therefore you make the weapon heavier, and in making it heavier you have to make it a bit more short so that it's more manageable. And so you lose some length, you lose some speed in the thrusting, but you gain the ability to cut or hook, and things like this. So generally speaking, as I keep saying, there is no best weapon, there's no best sword, there's no best polearm, there is just simply the best choice or in some cases a personal choice of weapon for a given scenario or context, and there's my favourite word again, context. Um, and a question came up, or rather a point came up in the comments underneath that video, basically saying that surely there are certain types of sword which are more versatile than others. Yes, broadly speaking, there are, I will say that um, there are, there is a group of swords that are kind of a jack of all trades, okay? So if we take uh, a sabre, for example, I'll just grab one, uh, grab one off the wall, there we go, I'll take this one. Um, so a sabre is, fits into this kind of average category and it's what I often refer to in uh, replies when I'm responding to comments underneath my videos. I often respond, uh, re uh, refer to it as a cut and thrust sword. The reason I say that is because essentially it's not a specialised thrusting sword, it's not actually a specialised cutting sword. Um, and it's this kind of jack of all trades, it's a kind of average sword. And the point I want to make, and I have made this point in a, in a longer video that was perhaps more, the point I was making was more oblique because I covered more points, so I want to spe like focus on this point and make it shorter, so I'll stop waffling. Um, and that is simply that there are a lot of swords that fit into this kind of average area in the middle. Um, sabres, arming swords, medieval arming swords, back swords, basket hilted broadswords, um, certain types of Indian sword, like, if I just grab one here, like the Kandar, or, or uh, Susan Pata, this might be actually, but Kandar type uh, swords, uh, straighter, straighter bladed Indian sword, rather than the Tulwa, which is more specialised cutting sword. Um, uh, side swords as well, another example. Uh, what other kind of Chinese uh, Jan? Um, to an extent, uh, Chinese Dao, um, certain types of Mesa and certain types of Falchion. So essentially there's lots of, from a wide, you know, all over the world for a wide period of time, there are a whole bunch of swords that they can thrust pretty well, they can cut pretty well, and they're kind of average length um, and kind of average weight, and you can wear them easily and they have varying degrees of hand protection and the hand protection tends to be more of a contextual thing related to um, you know what the kind of the type of warfare of that period where the shields are used where the hand protection is worn gauntlets and such like um, so I guess the point really is that lots of swords fit into this average category and in that category I don't really think that any of the swords have a, a real marked advantage or really marked difference over the others. What's really the difference between a sabre and a backsword? Almost nothing, to be honest. The uh, backswords tend to have, and they don't always, but they tend to have more like basket hilts and more protective hilts, and they're a bit straighter, but you look at this sabre and this is almost straight as it is, it's only slightly curved. Does the slight curve help at all? Well, it, it, incre it increases the cutting capacity slightly, it reduces blade wobble during the cut slightly, which increases um, essentially transference of force to the cutting edge, um, and the curve can be used in certain techniques to get around someone's guard, either the cuts or thrust. Um, so the, the cut has some really margin, sorry, the curve has some really marginal benefits, but it also has, like I mentioned before, when you add something, you take something away, 
having the point offline slightly, so it's not exactly in line with what I'm pointing it at, um, is a slight disadvantage in a lot of thrusting techniques. So generally speaking, specialised thrusting swords tend to be straight. So, but really there's no real big difference. No significant, no, you know, no real noteworthy difference between a back sword and a sabre. They're essentially the same kind of sword. Is there a real noticeable difference between a medieval arming sword, you know, the, the typical, the type of sword a crusader uh, might carry, for example, um, and, and, and a sabre? Well, they're not hugely different in length. Generally speaking, medieval arming swords tend to be a bit shorter in the blade, um, although some of them are, are as long as this one. This has got a 36 inch blade, it's quite a long one this. Um, so you do get medieval arming swords with 36 inch blades, definitely, but they, probably the average medieval arming sword is more like about 31, 32 inches in the blade. They don't have as much hand protection as a back sword or a sabre, but that of course is because they were being used by people, in war anyway, they were being used by people who had male gloves in the earlier period and later plate gauntlets, and they were being used by people with bucklers and shields, so you didn't need as much hand protection. Um, so they don't have as much hand protection, but the blade basically does the same kind of things. It's a similar weight, it's a similar size. It's got two edges. Again, you know, you again you add one thing, you take something away. Is there a big advantage to having two edges? Well, in certain longsword systems, you do use both edges for things um, in certain techniques, uh, particularly in uh, Lichtenauer longsword. Uh, and indeed in Messe, um, in treatises that deal with the use of the Messe, the Messe being a falchion like German um, sort of common person sword, um, you do equally use the short edge as it's called, um, the clipped back false edge for some techniques and that. But the, in actual fact, you know, as I've mentioned before, a lot of single edge swords actually have a false edge at the back here and you can use that false edge for things that were called the manchette or cuts at the, at the sleeve or the, or the arm. Um, so there are techniques which use the back edge even with single edge swords, um, but generally speaking, in most uh, manuals of fencing, most systems of fencing using a double edge sword, mostly it's the front edge and the point that get used. The back edge is probably at least tertiary. It's, it's you know far down the list from the front edge and the edge and the and the point. Um, so really there's not actually functionally, you know, in the grand scheme of things, there is far more difference between whether I'm holding a sabre, a back sword, a side sword, uh, a, a broad sword or an arming sword, they're all roughly similar compared to other weapons. So if I was to compare any of those swords with a Zweihander or with a halberd or with a spear um, or a, some kind of battle axe, then very clearly those swords would be very, very, very similar in comparison to each other compared to comparing any one of those swords with something like a halberd or a spear or a flail or a mace or something else, okay? So this is the point really, people get, especially, I think it's something from computer games and role playing games that people get fixated on individualism and trying to show that, oh well, you might like the uh, basket hilted broadsword, pers but personally I prefer the uh, the back sword. Uh, and actually, there's there's so little difference between them. When you're actually fighting someone and you're thinking about distance, timing, defending yourself, and hitting them, those things are far far more present in your mind, and they're so basic, and you can apply them to basically any sword. Um, with only minor differences that come down to length of the weapon, weight of the weapon, balance of the weapon, and if you've got hand protection or not. I mean, those are the basic things that affect how you use a sword, a one-handed sword. Um, so really, lots of swords are really very similar. And many, many people ask me, oh, you know, I, I see that you like sabres. What do you think about the Chinese Jan? And my answer in that situation would be, well, the Chinese Jian is fairly like a medieval arming sword. It's essentially a medium length, medium weight, cut and thrust blade. It's got two edges like a medieval arming sword, and it has no real handguard, um, or at least only a tiny little handguard that's not going to really protect your hand very much. So in, in use, you could use it exactly like a medieval arming sword, and it has exactly the same considerations. If I was trained in sabre and I was given a um, Chinese Jian to use, 
fine, I could still use it like a sabre, but I would just have to remember, okay, this has less hand protection than I'm used to, so instead of maybe standing with the hand in front of me here, I might stand with the hand higher up and further away from the opponent. So these are minor, minor differences, but by and large, in the grand picture of warfare and how weapons are used, most one-handed, medium-length, medium-weight swords are kind of similar. They're certainly vastly more similar to each other than they are to other weapons that they might encounter on the battlefield, be it bayonets or maces or poleaxes or whatever. Okay, I hope that helps a bit. Cheers!